All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about user rights and responsibilities, the rights and responsibilities that any user has when they're actually interacting with an information system and an organization. Now, a user, we're going to talk about a user as one who uses an information system rather than one who is actively developing the information system. Uh, one could be a developer and a user at the same time, but we're talking about the uh, role of a person who is actively using that information system. They are on the hardware, they're typing on the keyboards, they're using the software, they're working with the data and following procedures. So in this, I also want to uh, specify that we're talking about an employee. So uh, hypothetically, if you are working with an information system at a company, uh, this is the type of user that I'm talking about. You would be the type of user that I'm talking about if you get hired and you're using some kind of information system. So that is the scope of this discussion, the scope of the term user for this video. Now, in an ideal scenario, users should have rights regarding information system use in a company. And you have rights specifically because, you know, you're relying on an information system in order to fulfill your job requirements and avoid getting in trouble for not fulfilling your job requirements. So you have the right for an information system to assist you in doing that. And if the information system is failing and you're getting in trouble because of your information system related work not being able to be complete, um, that would be a uh, violation of the rights that were specifically talking about regarding being a user of an information system. So these are things that you should be guaranteed in a business. Um, should as in this is what an ideal business would be doing. There's not necessarily a guarantee that this uh, kind of stuff will be followed unless not following it would violate labor laws or something like that. But this is what you deserve to have as a worker. Now, users should also have responsibilities specifically with regards to helping the information security department make a good information system that can benefit the company and therefore serve you. Because if a information system isn't working very well and it's impacting your work, the information system department would actually be on the hook for that because they didn't make a good enough information system, but they need feedback from users in order to make that good information system department among other things. There, there are a number of responsibilities that an information system user should have in order to assist the information systems department in doing their jobs. And, We'll actually talk about both the rights and the responsibilities, but um, failing to follow these responsibilities may waste the information systems department resources and time. Uh, and if they're wasting their resources and time, they can't, that, that's like less that they can do to develop better information systems. It's a waste of money. Uh, it might possibly affect everyone throughout the company. So every user of the information system has certain responsibilities in order to make things run smoothly. That's the idea that we're getting with in this video is that every user should have rights and every user should have responsibilities. Um, we're going to talk about the rights and responsibilities uh, throughout the rest of this video. As a user, you have the right to computer tech that allows you to perform your job proficiently. If you have an old busted up computer that can barely run a modern web browser, that's not going to let you do your job. You might barely even be able to check your email before the thing's battery runs out. So you need good technology. You should have a reliable network and internet connections that allow you to do your job, um, which Reliable doesn't necessarily mean working 100% of the time. We're pretty lucky in the sense that um, a lot of our internet seems to work pretty frequently, especially if we have um, 
broadband or something like that uh, compared to what dial-up used to be like where someone making a phone call could interrupt a website from loading or uh, satellite internet where if it's just a little too cloudy all of a sudden it takes 20 times as long to load google.com um, that kind of stuff was not very reliable uh, dedicated broadband with relatively fast internet speeds is reliable. It may go down every once in a while, especially if, say, there's a natural disaster related scenario, um, but most of the time it's going to work. Uh, network and internet, that distinction is really important because there's the actual connection to the internet, uh, which allows you to go to different websites and stuff, but there's also the uh, internal network, things like being able to connect to the Wi-Fi or being able to plug a desktop computer that you're working at on a desk uh, into the wall for a good ethernet connection. You need both of those in order to actually do your job. So that's what you deserve to have as a user. You deserve a secure computing environment. The organization should protect the computer hardware that you are working on. It should protect the data that you are working with. You shouldn't really need to think too much about security unless your job is security. I mean, you, you should be security minded in terms of like doing your part to avoid phishing scams or not go to malicious websites or not download ra random programs that end up being malware. Like there should be things you think about, but that shouldn't be the entirety of your job. That should just be like a background thought that you have automatically as you go about going to different websites, downloading different things, working with different files, all that kind of stuff. Um, you should still think about it, but it shouldn't be the majority of what you're thinking. You shouldn't be constantly worrying about if your files will still be safe uh, when you return the next day. So the, compu the uh, organization should make a secure computing environment, probably maintaining a really good firewall, uh, providing good antivirus for computers, all that kind of stuff. You have the right to contribute to requirements for new system features and functions, especially if you have things that you absolutely need in order to do your job. If you have very specific programs that have uh, very specific, you know, requirements for hardware and software, like, hey, this program can only run on uh, Mac OS and there are no other alternatives. So. For me to be able to do my job, I need this somehow to be integrated. That should be something that you're able to bring up in conversation in some of these uh, requirements meetings. You should be able to talk about what you need for your job, the things that would be actively harmful for your job. And I mean, like, things that would make it absolutely impossible. If it's a change in procedure that would make things inconvenient, sometimes you have to live with that. But you should be able to give the absolute, like, critical priorities for being able to do your job successfully, as well as maybe some nice-to-have options. Like, it would be nice for me to do this or have access to this application or something like that, but I understand if you can't do it. You should be able to give those. You should be able to participate in those kinds of meetings. Because you're working with the information system, it's going to affect your work if there are any changes in requirements. So you should be able to pitch in and say what you need. You deserve reliable systems development and maintenance in order to make sure that the hardware and software that you're working with are going to continue working. If things are unmaintained and all of a sudden your computer refuses to, refuses to turn on and you don't know why, or the network, you know, the server that handles uh, the entire email server, all of those hard drives just suddenly break and you lose access to a whole lot of stuff and not to mention all the email, like your ability to send emails is kind of gone for the time being. Um, that would be really bad. So you have a right to systems that are up to date and maintained in order to run your work. You also deserve prompt attention to problems, concerns, and complaints. We'll put an asterisk on this, uh, an imaginary one, because I realized I forgot to put that on my PowerPoint, but put an imaginary asterisk on this. 
uh, when there are problems and concerns and complaints that are preventing you from doing your job and you need to do your job in order for the business to make money, then you should be able to get help as quickly as it can be provided. Now, that doesn't mean immediate. Sometimes there is a certain number of help desk workers and they can't get to you right away because they're helping other things. Sometimes there are more important problems that need to be addressed first, even if you put in your ticket first and you might just have to wait and your manager might just have to get off your back about it. Um, but as soon as they are able to help, they should be helping you and trying to work as efficiently as possible to resolve your problems. And this gets into the uh, next point, which is properly prioritized problem fixes and resolutions. When something does go bad, uh, you should get that help quickly. Um, of course, with respect to prioritization, if they need to put out a fire regarding the email server, that's probably more important. But then after that, they can probably try to help with whatever problems you might be having. And of course, you deserve effective training because if you can't even use the information system at all, or if you're having a lot of trouble using it efficiently, that information system is no longer a tool that you can use in order to do your job. It is a barrier. It is a hurdle. You have to overcome it in order to do things, and you deserve to be able to work with it as a tool. It's in everyone's best interest because it will help you uh, work better. It will help you add more value to the company and you'll be able to keep your job. All that being said, every user still has responsibilities such as learning basic computer skills. Uh, an information system, fundamentally, no matter what that information system does, it will rely on computers. And if you are using an information system, that means you will be interfacing with it through the use of a computer. Um, now, of course, you are in this class to help learn basic computer skills. So this is a responsibility you are actively working on. Good for you. Um, being able to use a computer efficiently and well will very much help you with um, being able to do a whole lot of different roles in a whole lot of different jobs. So this is really important and good for you for taking this class. You want to learn the best practices for the applications you use as well so that you know not just how to use whatever you know software applications you're actually using. You want to go beyond that. You want to learn how to use it efficiently. You want to learn the best solutions for how to do certain things in the software, how to address certain problems in the software. Um, now, the best practices might also include things like uh, protecting your passwords for some of those applications. Um, it is very important to be security minded when you are working with the applications and the information system, whether that's uh, your email through something like Microsoft Outlook or your uh, password for any other number of services. If you do not protect your password well and your password gets stolen, that could not only affect you, but that could possibly affect other people. Let's say we're talking about the email. If you lose control of your password, someone could get into your email and start sending out phishing emails. Or they could even try to use your password in such a way that they can try to determine how um, passwords are stored and verified on Microsoft's servers. They're stored in an encrypted way in order to um, prevent people from just looking at, like, you know, breaking into Microsoft's file looking for passwords.txt and copying all the passwords and just using them that way. They have to be stored so that Microsoft can verify the password, but they store them in an encrypted way. 
but a password might be able to try to reverse engineer how that encryption works if they get your password and try to compare it to the way that Microsoft stores passwords. So you losing your password could potentially lead to a breach of a whole lot of other people's passwords, which would be bad, either through phishing or through this reverse engineering process. And that ties into following security and backup procedures. Um, I kind of said everything with uh, the security side of things with regards to passwords, but you know, you want to follow the procedures. You want to stay safe. You want to prevent yourself or the organization from getting harmed. Uh, with backup as well, you want to make sure that you are saving whatever data that you're working with in a safe way, not just keeping it on your computer hard drive because those can fail, but also saving it to whatever cloud system there is. Uh, that, you know, whatever database that you are working with, any changes that you make on a local copy of data would need to be saved to the copy that everyone has access to. And you would need to do it carefully uh, in order to prevent uh, incorrect modifications or something like that. But uh, making sure that your data is all backed up, however those procedures are lined up for your company is going to be really important. And we talked about this already. Uh, protect your passwords. They're very important. Change them frequently. Uh, maybe every few months or so for like a very high sensitivity type of deal. Uh, if you change your password, um, you might be able to avoid a case like what I mentioned before, where people will try to reverse engineer uh, passwords in order to try to gain other people's passwords. Or if there's a leak of passwords that you're not necessarily aware of, if you just change your password every few months, you might be able to accidentally protect yourself from a leak, a, a leak of passwords that you had no idea was a thing. Um, when I'm talking about the leak of passwords, uh, sometimes organizations with really poor security will get pa user password information stolen and posted on, uh, you know, who knows where, but usually on the uh, deep web. So, or the dark web, my apologies, different thing. But uh, people might then go and try to test out those username and password combinations, not just on the one site that got compromised, but also on other sites, just in case someone is reusing passwords. But if you're changing your passwords regularly, or if you're using two-factor authentication, like text message, like a, a text message code or a hardware based key or uh, security questions about information that you know, um, that can actually be really helpful in protecting the passwords as well. But, you know, changing them often to factor authentication will really help protect passwords. And that is a responsibility you have in order to keep the organization itself safe uh, and your uh, fellow workers safe. Uh, follow the employee computer use and network use policy. That's going to be, you know, avoiding going on certain sites if that goes against the network use policy. Uh, some organizations will ban social media uh, from use from their network or personal emails from their uh, email server. Um, unless it's like an absolute emergency or something like that. But in general, you want to follow these uh, guidelines in terms of what you're using these work devices for. Not to mention that anything you do on an employer network could possibly be monitored by an employer. So if you're doing any of that kind of stuff, maybe you're on break or something like that, uh, answering texts on break, sending emails on break, going on social media on break, it's much better to do that on a personal device rather than an employer-controlled device, and if possible, on, an, on a Wi-Fi that is not controlled by an employer. If they don't explicitly ban the use of a, v, of a VPN, you could always use a VPN uh, on a personal device when you're on break or something like that. But make sure you're follow, following the policy. Uh, don't use my words as justification if something that I suggested was actually banned in the policy and you uh, 
get in trouble for it. Uh, I'm not liable. Read the policy, follow the policy, and then do stuff on your own time, on your own devices, on a different network. So you don't even have to worry about your employer tracking the kind of stuff that you're doing on your own time when you're on break. It's very helpful. The next two are make no unauthorized hardware modifications and install only authorized programs. Uh, this might have to do with an organization having, say, very standardized uh, computer equipment. They might have, they might be doing some programs that are, uh, you know, like computer rental type of programs where you can't actually do that kind of modification. Uh, it could disrupt um, different programs uh, that you that they are installing on company computers in order to keep the computer safe or do maintenance or all that kind of stuff. Um, if you swap out like a hard drive or something, you could completely lose uh, access to that uh, the company's uh, license for an operating system or for certain applications or something like that, which could be really bad. Um, if you're swapping out RAM, that can potentially cause problems depending on how, you know, the kind of swap you're doing, the uh, RAM that you're swapping in with, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of possible problems that can come from swapping out hardware you know, making hardware modifications that then would waste uh, information system department resources and time trying to figure it out, and it's a mess. So don't do that kind of thing unless the company a-okays it. Also, similar note, install only authorized programs. You should only be installing programs that are necessary for your work. Um, this might depend on the scope of your position. So a programmer might have a lot more freedom in installing programs because they might be testing out different systems or installing different packages in order to write programs or all that kind of stuff. They might have a lot more freedom, whereas someone who is a, a technical writer or a customer service assistant or a, a technical sales um, person might have a lot more restrictions on what programs they're able to use because they don't really need to branch out and try other things. They have a more, um, they, they have a more, uh, I guess, predefined type of role. Not to say that you can't ask for the authorization to install other things if you think it might improve your workflow. For example, uh, if you're a technical writer, adding on a different word processor that you're more familiar with in order to actually write stuff might be okay as long as you ask for authorization first, but it's important to only do it with, with authorization so that the information systems department can determine compatibility and make sure that nothing bad is happening. You have to apply patches and fixes when directed to do so because uh, updates to programs, including your operating system, uh, could be there to resolve dangerous um, security flaws. Uh, so update your programs uh, when directed to do so. It is possible that broken updates actually get put out. Like someone puts out an update and it breaks that program and then they have to very quickly put out another update to fix what they mistakenly did. That's why the information systems department will test that update first, make sure everything is working correctly, and then direct people to do it. So you don't apply the patches and fixes immediately necessarily. You might have to wait, you know, you might have to just stare at that update notification until you're given the go ahead from the information systems department. It all depends on the situation, the structure of the company, all that kind of stuff. But you want to hit this balance between a patch might possibly break something, so I want to wait a little bit to see how things go, versus this patch might be fixing a very important security update. I need to install this immediately or else. Even if it does end up breaking things, it needs to be installed, uh, which usually they'll give you a notification of like, this is a very important security update. Install it now. But yeah, apply it when directed to do so. Now with, uh, 
giving input for requirements and systems. We talked about the fact that you have the rights to actually be able to give that input in order to make sure that the system is compatible with your job and your needs and all that kind of stuff. But when you're actually giving that input, you have the responsibility to give thoughtful input. Things like explaining the reason why you need something really badly or explaining, you know, this would be really nice, but I don't necessarily 100% need it. If the changes you make would conflict with this, then I'm fine doing something else or using something else or whatever. Um, maybe even doing research to see like upsides and downsides of using this, looking at different um, alternatives, seeing for yourself if there are alternatives or if there are things that have no alternative that you absolutely need. So showing that you have actually done the research, you know, let's say you need program X really, really badly for your work and you just tell them, I need program X or else. The information systems department might just be thinking, well, program Y is perfectly serviceable. It has all the same features as far as I can tell. So this person might be overreacting. It's going to conflict with what we need. So we're going to just implement it and make them switch to program Y instead. However, if you say, I need program X, here are the reasons why only program X will work. You know, these are the things that only program X does. Here are the reasons why program Y and program Z and program alpha and beta and so on don't actually meet those needs. Here, here are the reasons why, you know, either they don't have these features that I need or their implementation is really bad and it would cause a lot of problems with my work, all that kind of stuff. If you show that you have the research, well, for one, it saves them a lot of time because they don't have to do the research while they're also trying to work on this new system. But it also means that you're a lot more likely to have meaningful discussion with regards to these requirements and systems. And you might even be more likely to get what you need. It's very possible. There's a reason why I'm emphasizing in the discussion assignments, not just state what you believe about something, but also back it up with some amount of evidence. That is an incredibly useful skill to have. The final user responsibility is avoid reporting trivial problems. Um, if you turn to the information systems department with every single issue that you might be having without trying to solve things first, or without trying to do your own research on how to fix those problems or all that kind of stuff. What you end up doing is you end up wasting time and resources and, you know, the information systems people have a lot of work that they need to do. They have a lot of work maintaining systems and upgrading things and helping with like really important problems and all that kind of stuff. Their time is very limited. So the, any work that you can do in order to help them save time by first maybe trying to diagnose computer issues yourself, you know, figure out, hey, is there anything I can do that doesn't involve me installing some new uh, software or uh, changing out my hard drive or something like that, like doing anything drastic, but like, are there things I can do to try to resolve this problem? Such as, uh, have I tried uh, saving all of my work closing all my programs, turning off the computer all the way, and then turning it back on. Not just a restart, but turning it off all the way and turning it back on. Have you tried doing that first? It's the first question they're going to ask you because it solves a lot of problems and it will save them time if you've already done it so that they can get further into figuring out what the problem is. Um, if your computer isn't turning on, things like, have you tried plugging it in to make sure that the battery isn't dead? Or if the keyboard isn't working. Um, well, I mean, that's kind of a tough one, but like still turning it off and turning it back on can be really helpful. Or if um, everything is suddenly frozen, maybe waiting a certain amount of time and then just forcibly shutting off the computer and turning it back on might be helpful. If the network isn't connected, have you checked to see if your uh, 
or if the internet isn't working, have you checked to see if your computer is actually connected to the router? All those little things. If you can get rid of those trivial problems, if you can like debug all of that uh, and figure out, oh, well, this was the issue. I don't need help after all. Um, you'll save the information systems department a lot of time. And if it is a problem that's bigger than all of these things that you're testing, they're going to be grateful that you tried all of these things before contacting them because it saves a lot of time where they don't have to guide you through doing all of these different little tests yourself. So it's very important to try to figure out exactly what is going on and maybe take a few steps that you can think of to try to solve it before going to an information systems department and asking for help. Also things like, how do I um, insert a new slide in PowerPoint would be inappropriate to ask an information systems department, especially like, you know, help desk or something like that. Or um, how do I change the search engine on my web browser or things like that? You wouldn't want to ask those kinds of problems to a um, information systems department. That would be, that would end up just wasting a lot of time. Uh, this is going a little bit away from the textbook, but what can be really helpful when you are dealing with a problem like this is you don't just say something's wrong. I can't do this. What you want to do is give an, like give a description of the problem. Say, you know, what you were trying to do. And then what actions did you take when you were trying to do that thing? Kind of going through step by step, like, uh, I don't know, if you're having trouble logging into Pearson, for example, because, and we're getting some cryptic error because Pearson doesn't like to give uh, non-cryptic errors, you might say something like, I was trying to log into my lab IT in order to do my homework. I went to Canvas, I clicked on the My Lab IT and Mastering button, I clicked open my lab IT. When it asked me to sign in, I entered in my username and my password. I pressed enter. Here is the exact error message that I got. So a good example, that last part would be a good example of talking about what you expected to happen when you were doing the actions that you took and then what actually happened. So the help desk person can see the difference between what is supposed to happen and what isn't happening and that can actually be really valuable for debugging a problem like that so if you enter your username and password and it says uh something went wrong please try again later you know you say that the error says that when you were expecting it to log you in the tech support person might be able to say, okay, well, that error is really cryptic, but it's not saying that you have the wrong username or password. So it's probably not an issue with you resetting your password. So I'm not going to tell you to do that and see if that works. Instead, what I'm going to do is try to see if Pearson's web services are up. And then they might be able to try things like, uh, you know, checking to see if the Pearson servers are actually sending data back uh, using something called a ping. Um, they might try to look on Pearson's website themselves and see if there is a sort of list of all the services that are currently working versus some that might be experiencing issues. They might do all kinds of things and be able to come back to you with an answer. For example, it looks like Pearson's website or services are currently down, even the, though their website works. Um, My Lab IT is having some issues and I'm seeing some notices that people are having trouble signing in. So try waiting a certain amount of time. Maybe that might be a little more trivial in that kind of sense. Like it, it might count as a bit of a trivial problem if you're having trouble logging into a website. But I posit this as an example of how to help a tech support person help you. And then finally, I want to talk about, you know, tech support people are still people. It is their job to help you, but they are trying to help you. They are on your side. Even if you are dealing with a very 
frustrating problem and you're really upset at the technology, you still want to be kind to the tech support person because being kind will actually help things get resolved a lot faster. A tech support person will actually be able to work a lot faster if you're being kind versus if you're being really nasty to them and tell, telling them to hurry up and putting all that kind of stress on them. People don't tend to perform the best under stress. So it is worth being kind. The tech support person is just trying to help you. In the end, everyone is trying to work together in order to help uh, you know, do their jobs. All right, well, that is user rights and responsibilities. And with this, we conclude the whole discussion of information systems management. So thank you all very much for watching. Uh, the next chapter will actually be the final chapter, which will talk about uh, information systems development. So actually creating the thing rather than just managing it. So yeah, we're on the home stretch with this.